Good afternoon, everybody. This is a really special day for us at, um, at the college. Um, it is a, a great honor for me to have one of our preeminent Caribbean leaders, who sometimes I take the liberty to call my friend, uh, Dr. the Right Honorable Keith Claudius Mitchell. And I would just like to give you a brief on who Dr. Mitchell is. Uh, he's a true son of the soil of Grenada, uh, Grenada, Karyaku, and Piti Martinique. Um, he was born to Paul Mitchell in the village of Brisan. Dr. Mitchell received his primary school education in Grenada, the Happens Hill RC School. And then he went on to the University of the West Indies, Cave uh, Hill Campus where he read for a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics and Chemistry, and he followed that with a Master's degree from Howard University and a Doctorate in Mathematics and Statistics from American University. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is himself an educator. He taught first at Presentation Brothers College, and he was also a professor of mathematics at Howard University, where he also did consulting and provided services to many government departments and private corporations in the United States. Dr. Mitchell was first elected a member of parliament for St. George Northwest and has held that seat in each subsequent election since then. And he been political leader of the new national party since uh, 1989. In 1995, he was elected for the first time as Prime Minister, winning eight of the seven seats in the House of Representatives. Dr. Mitchell has experienced electoral election victories in 99, 2003, 2013, and most recently in 2018, including an unprecedented sweep of polls on three occasions. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is also Minister of Finance, national security, public administration, home affairs, and information communication technology. In last December, he celebrated his 35th anniversary as an elected parliamentarian. In addition to his domestic responsibilities, uh, Dr. Mitchell, as I said, is a true Caribbean man. He served in various capacities at the regional and international level, including chairman of CARICOM, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, Chairman of the Ministerial Council of the Association of Caribbean States, Chairman of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, Chairman of the World Bank Small States Forum. He's presently the president of the SIDS DOC, so serving an extended term by special request. He's also chairman of the Monetary Council of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union and the lead head of government for science and technology in the CARICOM quasi cabinet. Dr. Dr. Mitchell is also one of the co-commissioners of the Global Commission for Adaptation. Aside from that, he's a, been a long serving parliamentarian. He's an avid sportsman, um, but he made his mark in cricket, serving as the captain of the Grenada cricket team. And if you want to find Dr. Mitchell at half past four in the morning, check him at the gym. So, Honorable PM, as I said, this is really a pleasure for me, and I turn, I, I turn the floor over to you to share your perspectives on digitization. Similarly, it's a pleasure, my brother, and of course, and uh, friend, and of course, to all my brothers and sisters that are listening. And formerly, let me say that as the Rector of City and College of Labour and Corporate Studies, the faculty, staff, and students of City and College, my guest sisters and brothers across the Caribbean region who are listening to us at this time, other participants beyond the Caribbean. Pleasant good afternoon to all of you. First of all, let me thank my brother, Dr. Henry, and the Cyprian College of Labor and Corporate Studies for the kind invitation to speak on the challenges posed by COVID-19 for the Caribbean 
and the patient adaptation required. In the context of the rapid rate in digitization, I must commend the organizers for adapting the new norm and providing a series of virtual engagement opportunities. It is humbling to see the level of participation, participation in today's webinars. And I look forward to the period of engagement after my presentation. Certainly, COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic has upended the life as we knew it, bringing unforeseen challenges and causing unimaginable economic and social impact. For tourism dependent countries like Grenada and those in the Caribbean as a whole, we have witnessed the virtual collapse of the tourism industry as countries close their borders in an attempt to curb the spread of this dreaded disease. The almost instantaneous decline in economic activity essentially means that countries are now faced with massive economic contraction and fiscal imbalances, deteriorating terms of trade and increasing national debt that can become unsustainable. My dear sisters and brothers, in short, we are facing a potential crisis in the financial system, as we know. A predicament with rising unemployment and a looming calamity in the social sector. Our simple our supply chains have been significantly disrupted. And the regionalism we have fought to develop certainly is at risk. The list detailing the impact of this pandemic goes on and on. But suffice to say, my dear friends, we are certainly in unprecedented times. And as such, there needs to be an unprecedented, strategic, immediate and forward-looking response, responses, sorry, which will ideally be, be, be geared towards building a greater resilience in our respective countries and the region as a whole. As countries emerge from the lockdown and the regional borders begin to reopen, we begin the odious task of rebuilding battered economies. Many countries, Grenada included, have established various committees to provide strategic guidance to governments. A multi-sectoral approach has always been the best path towards that development. And this approach takes on even greater significance now as we chart the way forward in the COVID-19 era. Our future path must be data-driven and that data, information, and knowledge constitute the bedrock for efficient, effective, innovative, and practical responses that are essential for proposed and implemented solutions. This data-driven pathway forms the nucleus of the digital transformation that must take charge center stage in the, in the individual and collective development agenda of Caribbean countries. In fact, according to the World Economic Forum, we are in a fourth industrial revolution, which is highlighted by the impact of digitization, with emerging technologies changing our lives in unprecedented ways. My brothers and sisters, all. A digitized economy 
A digitized Caribbean is the way to the future. The critical pathway for addressing the growing demands and appropriately increasing the technological sophistication that is necessary for citizens in this time. There is no denying the relevance of fundamental digital transformation to enhancing the survivability of the regional country in the new COVID-19 landscape is absolutely essential. Up till five months ago, we were hard pressed to see paper transactions and face-to-face -face meetings as anything but mandatory. Today, thanks to the pandemic, in a strange way. These are rapidly becoming relics of the pre-COVID life. In the new dispensation, we meet virtually as we are doing now and achieving the same results and we work from home and are equally maybe in some instances even more productive and in our view less costly. The takeaway here is that in every crisis, it is always said there are opportunities. And the pandemic has presented the opportunity to reset the de development agenda. We are at that critical juncture where we can re engineer government systems and processes through technology enabled application and services. It is clear to all of us that government as a service provider must reevaluate the services and in keeping with the digital, digital lexicon, we must commit to a reset or rebound. This will allow for digital inclusion and must go hand in hand with the adaptation of available technology on a wider scale. The underlying infrastructure that will facilitate or enable this digital transformation is affordable and robust internet, inter, internet services are certainly required. The existing private sector and budding entrepreneurs must also take advantage of the available technologies and adjust their business models and business continuity plans to assist with re-emerging re -emerging regional economies. Our students too must be able to study and gain certification through online applications and the education system must be designed to produce high quality outputs with digital skills and acumen and a pension for innovation and creativity. In making the education system more STEM oriented, that is focused more on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we begin to foster the innovative and enterprising capacity of students, preparing them to lead in this new technological driven environment. In this regard, therefore, I challenge our brothers and sisters in Cipriani, Cipriani College to reevaluate its programming, intensify its offerings, get in this direction, and employ the tools and platforms to help the digital transformation that we speak about. Similarly, the challenge exists for governments throughout the entire region to enable public offerings where, for example, digital, digital banking and digital currencies will transform the banking, finance, and payment landscapes. Where economic diversification, job creation, enhanced labor productivity, innovation, and e-commerce through digital technologies will become second nature, where regionalism, single market and economy, and 
as it said like this, it says, remain not merely just lofty ideas, but, but must become attainable objectives. Earlier, I referenced the importance of a multi-sectoral approach. Here I note that the challenges is also about, about for our social partners or trade unions or non-governmental organizations, private sector organizations, churches, and faith-based organizations or schools, our colleges and universities, and our other centers of learning, or regional organizations to conscientiously work towards to promote innovation and to establish an institutional infrastructure to facilitate that digital transformation. We cannot dispute that COVID-19 has created new sociological, political, and socioeconomic environments that, we must be, that must be bolstered by our awareness of this new norm to act. And as we witness the various manifestations of the breakdown of the norms, the weakening of entrenched institutions, the examples of citizen dissent, the make of, trans of fragmentation, the breaches of cybersecurity and privacy. We must embrace digital transformation as a useful tool to address these social ills and concerns. My dear sisters and brothers, just over a year ago, I, I had the opportunity to participate in the Caribbean Future Speech a simulation developed by the Caribbean Telecommunication Union to demonstrate the use of ICT to accelerate social and economic development. That simulation enabled participants to understand the game-changing transformation that life in the region could undergo if available cutting-edge technology was properly applied. The speed efficiency and resilience of a fully integrated digital carbon demonstrated in the simulation in that simulation represent the epiton of regional collaboration i dare say covid 19 has illustrated that we must begin marching more assertively towards that future of a single ICT state a goal that has been in the pipeline since 2014. The achievement of this obviously requires a significant commitment on the part of all Caribbean governments, not only to the regional objective, but it must begin with a digital transformation on a national level. Countries must be ready to enhance their capacity to maximize the potential benefits of this ICT revolution that will power the next phase of our development. At the same time, however, we must move away from the traditional silo approach to one of the for greater collaboration that would lead to seamless delivery of integrated public services. This is the brothers. Governments must move to improve the rate of ICT adoption among our people to the point that it almost becomes an inevitable right. Further, we must harness the innovative capacity of our people to develop more ICT related businesses and create opportunities for growth. Here in Grenada, we have rolled out an ambitious digital transformation agenda to build a smarter, more resilient government. We need therefore to make business, doing business with government, simple, fast, and convenient for people. To facilitate this, broadband connectivity has been established island-wide and we have developed a master governance portal 
that provide a single entry point to access government and its services. Our flagship project, Digital Governance for Asian Europe, will put in place the, funda the foundational integrated digital infrastructure, payments and identity that will enable government to operate in a digital by default modality. That infrastructure will allow government to leverage technologies to support end-to-end -end service integration to achieve our goal of de delivering an agile, citizen-centric services, and at the same time, create more efficient organizations and build a more resilient and responsive government. This is just a snapshot, my friends, of what one country, my country, is doing. But it is important for us all to keep advancing our digital transformation agenda if we to have any chance of success in our new normal. We must move aggressively to adopt and utilize available technologies to further advance the development of processes. In conclusion, therefore, it is important for me to reiterate the imperative need for us to collectively re-engineer our thinking, our approaches, and our processes, and our developmental philosophy to embrace digital transformation to create a future that all of us want. Thank you. And I look forward to the rest of this evening and day. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Um, the questions have started coming in. Um, I would just, I, I see the theme, uh, transformation and adaptation. And I have a question from Dr. Valentine Smith, who asks, what economic impact do you think the development of an, adapt an adoption of robotics and intelligence systems will have on work in the common in the Caribbean community. It, it will transform all aspects of our life. Um, it will certainly make the, the the services of government much cheaper in every respect. It will make it easier to uh, access in every sense. It will also, if, if properly used, can bring people far closer together in an integrated form. And it can give us, in every aspect of life, whether it's in the area of health, whether it's in the area of infrastructure, whether it's in the area of all um, financial activities, every single area can be enhanced in a very significant way. With the initiative in those, in those areas. I have since spoken um, from Baltimore, from the John Hopkins Medical Institute, from Dr. Shanta Purcell. And uh, she is said she's very, she sent you greetings, and she said she's very interested in the good governance aspect of work life digitization. And she hopes that, that you will speak to that. She has to come back home and, and help me. <laughs> With one of my favorite students years ago, uh, I'm so happy. Uh, we look forward. And now that, that is the way to go, I think. Um, unfortunately, we're not just for Grenada, my, my, my sister, it's for the entire Caribbean. It's unfortunate that we still have not, have not reached anywhere close where we should be at this point in time. But maybe, as it was said, sometimes things happen for a reason. I think this pandemic has certainly forced us to rethink and, and to do the things that we should have been doing long before um, the pandemic, pandemic stuff. So certainly that, that's an area we, we certainly want. But we need all the human resources and support that we can get to move in that direction. One, one um, 
one expects that digitization would would be a lot easier to um, to link back and network with um, with our our human capital that is that is residing out of the region. I have a question, uh, Dr. Mitchell, from Mr. Christian Mora, and he is asking whether you can touch on what you would see as some of the high level implementation strategy factors that you think uh, are imperative? Well, I, I think, first of all, I, I can make the two question of a, that um, single ICT space. I, I think it's something that we, unfortunately, I, I thought in, in, in you know that um, presentation, it struck me that since this is 2014. Yeah. It's 2014. And it was so advanced, so more advanced in the digitization process in our country which was all the paperwork and all the things that we've been doing all the years, unfortunately. And I think that's a fundamental aspect and the training of our people in all aspects of, of the technology is it, so crucial. So I think it, we, we have to invest the resources. You know, there we have to have the available equipment. Well, in our case, the, the, the portal that we have developed it's key, and I think all countries have to move in that direction. So I, I think um, the investment is going to be key. Yeah. The question of the, the technology is going to be key as well. The schedule of training, these are all going to be fundamental factors if we are going to, to build on, on the whole process of digitization, which is so crucial for where we are at this particular time. PM, I have a question from Mr. Imo. Bakari, and he comes to the issue of the tourism dominated economies in the Caribbean. And he wants to know whether if you think it is possible through the creation of tourist digitalization platforms to financially counterbalance the economic fallout arising from drastically reduced tourist arrivals. Well, <laughs> It, it's clear. We, we all the while we are riding a wave of success in our tourism activities. Yes, we are doing well. I, I'm, I'm sitting here today, never expected that our economy would have been hit so hard by one single event. And I think that is happening right around the world. But in the case of the Caribbean, it has played havoc. I think we we don't realize that the process of the technology has technological advances. It's appropriately utilized with the, with the kind of skills and and I would say innovation of our young people. If we are able to to develop and invest more in technology, there's so much areas of opportunity outside of direct tourism activity that can in fact empower young people, give them employment that can make up the very independent citizens and to create far more wealth, far more wealth than, than, than a particular aspect of the tourism product. We don't always have the serious in opportunities in tourism, but the impact of one activity affecting such a major area of economic activity and livelihood of the people will not be so devastating if we had the diversity and the technological opportunities that are available to so many different areas of services that we can involve ourselves in. I have a question, PM, from Dr. Valentine Smith. And Dr. Smith asks, in a digital world economy um, with COVID-19 as a factor, and this economy is dominated by the developed countries, culture, science, research, manufacturing, production, and distribution, imperative of goods and services. What do you see as some of the positives for economic survival in the Caribbean community? Well, there are so many areas, and, and it goes like that. 
and bring to the whole question of that thing right to be fixed. It goes right back there. So many areas of opportunity for people. If we are able to invest and get our service providers to be able to provide those the technology, the services, the, the connectivity, um, much cheaper than we have at this point in time. And it, in all the areas of opportunity will, will in fact be enhanced, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's in, in, in the whole question of, of the culture and arts, all areas of opportunity will be broadened and, and expanded. Because, you know, one thing I recognize, Andre, that all young people are far more advanced than we think they are, you know, and far more ready for this revolution that is right in front of us that we are not. That every single area of opportunity will, in fact, be enhanced and broadened with significant opportunity for all our people through the length and breadth of the Caribbean. But again, the more we unite our, 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 our economy, the more we are prepared to work closer together. And I'm not sure yet we have reached that stage because sometimes we take significant decisions at the regional level. And when we get back into our environment, then we go back to the, this, this uh, um, silos which create enormous problems and problem for us and reduces the capacity of all, all people to, to get opportunities in all these areas that I just mentioned. PM, it seems as though you anticipated the question for Mr. George Bob, because Mr. Bob asked, Mr. Bob comments that some people say thanks to the flame of our Caribbean leaders, the Caribbean has failed to become an effective economic unit necessary for viable digitization. And he asks for your comments. But I, I, I won't put you on the spot on that one. <laughs> Uh, but Mr. I Nigel, I think you know my views on that one. Yes, sir. Mr. Nigel Bagwatsarana sends you his greetings and he asks, Do you think that there has been a productivity paradox in the Caribbean where the benefits of ICT have been lagging despite high upfront costs that have been borne by governments and businesses? You know, in other words, what has been the take? And what would be some of the reasons if there is such a lag? Repeat that. I didn't get repeat the, the question again. That, that All right. I so he we said have, we have in a, and we have in a, a communication thing and hearing part of what you asked him and, and missing some words. Okay, so, sorry. He said, Do you think yes. that there has been a productivity paradox? A productivity, in, a productivity paradox. Oh, okay, yes. In that governments in the Caribbean and some businesses have made very have made very high upfront investments in um, in ICT, but yet still we see productivity lagging, as if there is a delay in the uptake of the benefits of the um, of those investments. I think that. I think it has a lot to do. While some of us have made the investment that we should, and I don't think we all have done it collectively, I think buying to the, the society, getting the people on board to potential opportunity has been a factor. And remember, if we do not change that public service that we have, the mindset of, of into a 21st century atmosphere. I think that is a fundamental issue. You can have all the technology, you can have all the investments, and I see it. But if you do not have buying and the leadership, and I'm not blaming the public something by itself, because we have to accept responsibility as leaders for, for not having got the, the, the people um, involved a lot more and, and understanding the importance of this. But I think that has a lot to do with the lack of education, the lack of leadership in the process of the elect throughout the public service, the public service, the private sector. And don't forget, and really, our trading and brothers and sisters have an important role to play. Sometimes you 
decisions that you take that can yield more efficiency, but not necessarily more employment opportunity in the traditional area. So you have to have the trade unions, the buying of the trade unions, and of course the the the, the stakeholders of, of all levels in the society. So I, I think education has to be a fundamental factor. So investment, yes, and many of us have done it, but I think we have to buy in at the public service level because if it doesn't, if it's not led by the public service, the country will also will have serious deficiencies at all levels. Thank you, PM. The questions are coming fast and furious. Um, the 2019 uh, to, uh, 2020 cybersecurity jobs report said that in the full year will be $3.5 million, million unfilled cybersecurity jobs. How can we prepare our people to take advantage of these opportunities? I, I think, you know, here again, I think the regional approach and great, because we have different levels of skill at the cadre level. Just the whole understanding of cybersecurity and, and its related um, um, areas. And not something I think of people are as, as, as a whole, in a general sense, understand. But as I go around the Caribbean and I meet with some of our bright minds, they understand this area so well. They understand the benefits of the technology, but they also understand some of the, the areas of concern. So I think at the regional level, we, we must invest more, we must share more of our, of our talent and, and resources at the, at, the, at the regional level. And I, I think it, it's an area that, as you just said, has tremendous opportunities. But the question is, how do we do it? Not just allowing each country to work on its own and trying to buy into that important area of opportunity and not having the resources to do so. So I think the regional approach has to be the fundamental part we need to go forward. Yeah, um... Mr. Michael Anizet, who is the General Secretary of the Caribbean Congress of Labor and a member of the Board of Governors of my institution, and whom you met in, in February and March. He's, I think he is going a little retro now, and he wants to know what will be required to have a true regional air and sea transport system given the need for intra-caribbean connectivity intra-regional connectivity <laughs> well, it, it goes right back to our commitment to the regional regionalism it goes right back to that i mean we if we see what's happening with the lat issue now it's a clear example that we are not yet clearly on the same board. There is no way we will be able to effect the best policy and the most effective policy for regional transport and the freedom of movement of our people if we do not accept the fact that the decision made today will not necessarily, all aspects of it, affect every country and every aspect positively. We all have to bear some consequences. And we have to be clear that where we're heading. To the, to the, I might not benefit, Grenada might not benefit in this area. But five years from now, the Grenada students and people will benefit. Yeah. But I have not yet seen Andrea, unfortunately. Too many times we see what is necessary. We see the decision that we must make. Mm -hmm. We, we meet at levels and we all agree, and then we go back on our own and do the complete opposite in silos, which would never work. And I think that's a fundamental problem. I give a simple example of the whole question of present situation in the air, when we have the other allies. Why can't we bring those parties together? Mm -hmm. All people are not traveling to individual countries. We are. They have a very small level of transport activities 
it may be violent. The interest is not cooperating and the government has to care for the role. I think you will see a lot more of this and the countries will benefit in very serious ways. Another point I want to make on this, look at the cost of transport, as you know. Just look at the cost of the transport from going from one country to the next. I remember playing in my college over the years. I could afford to talk about this because they know that spoke about the public here. Let us reduce the cost of taxes and tickets. Well, if I live, if I reduce my affording Grenada, all I have to do is lose revenue. If the taxes in the other countries, because if I have ticket from one country to the next, it becomes my cost that 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 comes. And and people are not willing to make that sacrifice, and I couldn't understand it because I said, look, if we reduce the taxes, we would not get the same amount of money on one ticket. But there'll be a lot more travels. If, if it would combine our efforts in reduction of the fees at the airports and also the tickets directly, I think you will see a lot more. We're not asking you to do it at the international level. We are asking the regional level to increase the transport and connectivity between our people. I honestly believe that, that but you know something? COVID-19 is the first time I've been to a meeting where almost every leader says we have to reduce the taxes. And, and, and so, so COVID-19 in some ways has got some reason to us that we That's probably would have had before. <laughs> so it, it is said that in every time there are there are some major problems, some that have to look at the opportunity that it created. Yeah. I believe two things so far, the question of the effect, the impact on regional transport might be an important factor. And I also believe the use of the technology the digitization um, necessity that I think um, this has brought to show us. We can still connect ourselves and still do business if we do have the more investment in the digitization process, which is more necessary for the region. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Atkins Vidal, who is actually the coordinator of the Emma Francois Institute, uh, which has organized this um, the Arab Francois Institute of the College, which has, which has organized this activity. And Atkins wants to know, what are two concrete things that regional governments must do so that we do not revert to the pre-COVID habits of fear of technology? <laughs> I think maybe the first thing is a commitment, one, to recognize the absolute importance of the technology and the role that it can play in investments and opportunities for development in a general sense. I think people want to see the impact, how that would affect us positively. I think also the necessity to invest heavily, a commitment for each of us to make a commitment to invest in that in the resources necessary to, to take advantage of that opportunity that it provides. I think they, I would say these are the two most probably important things. And I honestly want to go back to one thing, Andre, the question of the, that, that single ICT space, the commitment of it, and the necessity to put the resources necessary. I remember we started to talk about this, and we're looking at international support, but it wasn't coming. My solution, we can't wait. We, yeah. have to, we all have to make the sacrifice. So I would say that's another major factor. We must put the resources out because in the, in the long run, I think the benefits and the results of what we can bring to our economies and our people far away the investment that we put. Yeah, I have a follow-up. Um, Ms. Denise Demon says she is very happy to hear your passion. Um, and she wants to know what non-financial interventions or help do you think is needed 
to make this collaborative approach that you talk about. Um, this collaborative, I guess, creating of the ICT space. And I know from my own interaction with you, your, um, your commitment to the social dialogue and partnership, as you mentioned. But Ms. Lemon would like to know what are some of the things that you believe, um, what, what are some of the, 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 the contributions, non-financial, I guess? Well, we have various regional bodies that operate that in some ways have played made a role in the whole question of the technology, whether it's the CPU and other regional institutions. I think we have to have them working more collaboratively. I think that is the first thing we must do. I think also our stakeholders, Andre, at all levels, the all stakeholders working closer together and our commitment, each of us, to the private sector has a major role in the region. Mm -hmm. the, the trade union movement, and I, I really want to appeal to our trade union brothers and sisters. They have to be on board in this, in this whole atmosphere, the whole um, innovation that we are talking about. The, I, I, I've seen the, the involvement of our church leadership, even in this period when we ask them to cooperate and, and, and with respect to protocol, they've seen their commitment to the process. So I believe that the mindset of collaboration has to be a fundamental factor, both internally within our individual countries and uniting the, the different organizations in the region that play a, a, a major role in some of the in, initiatives in the, in the innovation areas that we're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> now, you said it doesn't require resources. It requires <laughs> And I think that is key. Yeah, we have a question on your government's position and what you have done because as a result of COVID-19, we have had the need for remote work. Yeah. And just as a, an exchange of view, what are some of the things that um, you have done to facilitate uh, remote, remote work? Well, we have held in our cabinet meetings. We have kept our cabinet meetings in normal. The only difference is that we're not in the same room. So we certainly, at the cabinet level, we have set that tone. We have certainly, even under lockdown period, we have made sure of some of our critical workers have the available um, equipment to be able to work. So many of our important institutions that function effectively during that particular period. And of course, we had. Um, I have had meetings with our social partners and on the virtually so regularly, keeping in touch with people and, and being able to, to make significant decisions that continue to make government function in a general sense. So we, we've done this. And of course, as you know, we have established a, a COVID um, secretariat um, that is providing serious similar support to all sectors of the society that are marginalized in this time. We have had the Ministry of Health leading the a subcommittee of cabinet, which is meets literally regularly some key members, which include not just government persons, but private sector people and, and persons in the area of health and, and different sectors that have in fact stayed on top of what is taking place with the COVID period. In fact, they are still very much involved as we prepare ourselves for the border opening. So we have made some significant strides in those areas because of the decision that we've made um, in a general sense. And I must say, Andrew, we have established task force for different sectors, for tourism, for education, for health. And we, we, I, I've been surprised, pleasantly pleased, surprised with the level of commitment and participation at all levels. Many of these committees, we have people who are busy doing their own things, who have their own problems, but they have not missed a single meeting. And we gave them a timeline to complete their work, each of the task force. And each of the task force committees presented a report and recommendation. So we met only a few days ago to look at the recommendations and to plan for the way forward in, in every sense. I'm, I'm, I'm excited 
while we're going through it, no problem. But I'm really excited by the level of cooperation and entry shown by the population as a whole at all levels. Yeah, um, I would, as, as head of a labor college, I just wanted to ask what, um, what, have, what, what protections have you put in to make sure that workers are not disadvantaged in, 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 in a time like this? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is to ensure that our employers and government, of course, is a, one of the bigger ones, understand the pain that is taking this of it. And we have to communicate that accordingly and reach out. The businesses also that employ a lot of persons cannot see this at a normal time. Some things that you may do or, or direct in the case of a, a worker's um, activity in normal times cannot be done now. Uh, and sometimes I've had to speak to some of them because some decisions that they took create problems um, <laughs> for the atmosphere of collaboration and understanding. So I think government have to set the tone with its own workers, and we've done that, as you know. We, yes. We've made enormous sacrifice. People been home for three months, and they pay every cent. Even some people have never traveled, or getting travel allowances. <laughs> um, so I think, but I also think our brothers and sisters in the trade union movement also have a role to play, and they must also send out the right message. So in times, in normal times, an action or statement you may make with respect to a particular issue, we cannot do the, the same statement in COVID time, or your action cannot be the same. So you may look at something that might be, might happen, and you you you, you, you think of going, and we call a strike. I'm not sure strike is the best approach. <laughs> At this time, you know, and I have to tell some of my friends that uh, while you might be right and have the right based on the action, you do everything first before you reach the position of under, under COVID 19, a strike. I'm not sure. So I think all of us, government, must understand that in the general sense, the workers are the ones that get hurt. Then any bad decisions will be made. The business community must understand it's not just about profit and the problem they are facing, but also the workers that they employ. Think of them and their families. Some of them are happy making in normal time a decent yeah. salary. And then you because of certain um, rule that you don't need to employ, you just you just abandon your commitment or or, or, or your re reason for, for helping workers in this difficult time. And our trade union, as I said before must also understand that they have a, a very serious role to play in understanding the pressure this the very important period that we're facing that facing all of us yeah this has been an absolute delight and an honor for me um i have quite a few more questions but i promise you i do not wish to get in trouble with philomena <laughs> 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 so I am going to stick with my time and so I, I hope that um, when time permits, because th this has been really a, a lively and a good and insightful exchange, I hope that when time permits, we will be able to welcome you in person at our college. Yes. So if you have anything else that you would like to tell us, I, I we can we will wrap up. So I, 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 Andrea, I think college, as you know, uh, is it, with its program and its mandate has an important role to, to play. And uh, I believe that maybe the college should play its way more around, not just in Trinidad. I think the kind of program that you you um, implement at the Trinidad College should be something that is emanated throughout the Caribbean region. You should let it be more of this and understanding the role of labor understanding the role of citizenry and the whole question of development. So I certainly hope to look forward to be able physically to be there sometime. And I certainly hope that with the opening of borders that we can and hopefully with the possibility of a vaccine being found uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I, but I hope
look forward to this so that we, we can be returned to a, a more of the, the physical atmosphere that we all miss. Because this is tough time for every four of us. You know, we are noticing, and I didn't mention this, but in our own country, we've seen a, a lack of patience in the part of people that have, there's a temperature rise that I see among human beings are willing to to understand each other more and ready to act violently. We've seen this among young people in particular, and I'm sure that it's happening around the Caribbean region. And I think the lockdown is just been a tough one for everybody. So I look forward to this, and I, I really, um, this, this has been a very illuminating session for me, and I request you as well. Um, Safely um, important in the context of where the Caribbean is and where we are, the people, and what we can do, and the use of technology. So I, I just look forward to this and, and look forward to seeing you again. And uh, take care. Yeah. Well, thank you, PM, and you'll be happy to know that um, to your point, we are working closely with the distinguished chairman of TAM CC to see how we can do some exchange of programs. Good. That's, that's <laughs> That's very confusing. Very confusing. You have to tell him he can't give up that job now. <laughs> I'll do that. God bless you, PM. Thanks much. Thank you, man.